using himself to us, revealing himself to us, because God is beyond us. He is spirit. There is no way that we can really comprehend God because we are limited human beings. It is only when God goes down to our level that we are able to know Him. Right? That's why. Right. And I was telling you that the full and complete revelation of God is Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we hear about God, things about God, descriptions of who God is. And then he reveals himself through many instruments, through creation, special occasions, like for example, the burning bush, remember, to Moses? But we don't actually see God. He just uses instruments to introduce himself to us, to reveal himself to us, until finally, in the New Testament, when Jesus came, he is God, remember? He is the Son of God. Therefore, with Jesus Christ, we do not hear about God, we heard God. We saw God. Okay? He entered human history. That's why He is the fullness of revelation. And when we accept the revelation of God, our response to upward movement is we call faith. Faith is nothing else but believing in whatever God revealed to us. Are you funny? Yeah. And whatever. Now, of course, all of the revelation is transmitted to two things, at least for us in the Catholic Church. Okay, for us, we say that God revealed himself through living tradition and through the Bible. So we are here. We are here in our what we are doing, the Bible class. We are only dealing with the Bible. But there's something bigger than the Bible, which is living tradition. Living tradition is, just my simple description of it, is the beliefs, the practices, okay, everything that is passed on from one generation to the other. The best example is, Old Testament is kind of very complicated, but let's just go to the New Testament. It's easier to understand. Like, for example, Jesus Christ, right? He was born. Born in the year, at this point, as we say, born year zero, right? That's when we start counting the year. Year one, two, three. He died at the age of? 33. And then, during that time, of course, people talk about Everything that he did, everything that he said, people talk about that. And then they pass on stories. We are part of that, right? As he was talking about things that happened. And then, as I was telling you, that's why I said it's easier to understand if you use the New Testament as a framework. Of course, people will now start to put into writing what they remember of Jesus. What Jesus thought, what he said, what he performed, you know, the miracles and everything. That's why, as I was telling, say, telling you last Thursday, remember that the Gospels, we have four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't think that the Gospels were written as actually Jesus was preaching. Huh? Don't think that us, just like me now, while I'm talking, you're taking notes. But the Gospels were not, were not done that way. The, very, the earliest gospel to be written is the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Mark was written in the year 40 AD. What year did Jesus die again? 33. So think about that. The first gospel to be written is Mark in the year 40. That means Jesus has been dead when Mark started writing the story. That has been Jesus was already seven years dead. That's why Mark was actually just starting to remember the events, the teachings of Jesus. But before that, it's living tradition. Living tradition, telling stories. Oh, you know, when Jesus was in Galilee, he met this blind man, he did like this. Oh, when he was in Bethsaida. And then Mark, people who, who actually witnessed and heard Jesus are beginning to be all just like us. <laughs> and they started saying, no, you know, when we our generation dies, nobody has actually witnessed the events and heard those actual words of Jesus. So we better put them, start putting them into writing. That's why they started writing them. Therefore, when Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John would begin writing their Gospels, the version of the stories, you think they will be able to put everything into writing? No. 
In fact, the gospel itself, the gospel of St. John, right at the end, will say, not everything that Jesus said and did were written. Because if everything is written, it's not even in that space. The word commentary, everything. So what does it mean? That means not everything is put into writing. That's why the living tradition is bigger than the Bible. That's why the living tradition is bigger. Now, my dear friends, that's very important for us Catholics. Huh? Very, very important. Why? Because a lot of our friends do not believe in the living tradition. The Protestants, they have uh, the doctrine, the principle, sola scriptura, scriptura, which means only the Bible. What is done in the Bible is not authoritative. We are not obliged to believe. You may have an idea, but you are not forced, quote unquote, to believe. Because it is not in the Bible. That's why you are not forced to believe in the computers. It's not in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> really? There are many things that we believe in the Catholic Church that are not found, strictly speaking, in the Bible. Like, for example, the Immaculate Conception, as I was telling you. You don't exactly see that in the Bible. There's no word immaculate conception. The Bible won't tell you that the person is very immaculately conceived. But everything that we believe can be deduced and has some support in that, the Bible. Like for example, what will be the biblical support in our belief that Mary was immaculately conceived? Well, first of all, remember that in the immaculate conception, I always take time in explaining this because I I really realize a lot of people are confused with the Immaculate Conception. In the Immaculate Conception, who is pregnant? Rose. <laughs> Seven months. <laughs> so in the Immaculate Conception, a lot of people would think that Mary is pregnant. So in the Immaculate Conception, it's Anne, the mother who is pregnant. She is conceiving the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is the Blessed Virgin Mary who is conceived. That's why when you see captions, Mary conceived that the original sin, there should be a comma after Mary. Because if you don't put the comma there, it means Mary conceived without sin. She's the one conceived. It should be Mary, comma, conceived without sin. It's a description of her who was conceived without sin. That's why when we write that, I see that I got Anyway, <laughs> so uh, because it was her being conceived by her mother and free from original sin, she has to be free from original sin because she will be the mother of the Savior. Now, I don't want, um, we don't have time to argue about that, but you know, sin is contagious in a way. Right? If Mary has original sin and she conceived the Lord Jesus, then the Lord Jesus will be contaminated with sin. <laughs> no. Are you following the logic? No. That's why. Right. Again? No, because he's God. Mm -hmm. and that's why she, the mother has to be prepared. Yeah, okay? So that's why she has to be prepared to be worthy to. Worthy. If Mary has original sin, she will not be the mother of the same. Mm -hmm. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. So, in a way, she was prepared. She was prepared. Only Mary received what we call in theology as preservative grace. Huh? She was preserved. Okay? So she was being prepared to be the mother of the Savior. That's why she was immaculate. Conceived. When you're talking about conceiving Jesus, that's not immaculate conception. That is annunciation and incarnation. Okay? But when you talk of immaculate conception, it's the Blessed Virgin, Mary being conceived by her mother, so that she will be worthy to carry, to bear our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, of course, as I said, even though it's not found in the Bible, you don't see that. Like the Bible will say, oh, Mary was conceived without sin. You don't see that. But we can have uh, uh, support in the Bible. Like, for example, Remember when Mary received the news from Angel Gabriel?
that she will conceive and bear a son. Remember what the angel Gabriel said, Hail, full of grace. Think about that. Full of grace. If you have a glass, okay, and it is full of water, really full, can you still put something there? More. Therefore, if Mary is full of grace, therefore, no sin. No sin. That's why by the angel Gabriel saying, Mary, full of grace, that means it's for us in our interpretations, like saying, Mary, who has no original sin, prepared to be the mother of the Savior. Okay? Prepared to be the mother of the Savior. Now, that's why the greatest argument there, right? Because in the Bible it says, everybody needs a Savior. Now, for Mary to have no sin, does she need a Savior? So how do you defend your Catholic faith then? And our friends would say, how can you go against the Bible when the Bible says everybody is born needs a Savior? She's carrying the Savior. Huh? She's carrying the Savior. She's carrying the Savior. <laughs> yeah, she said it out of humility. Yes, that is on first. She still needs uh, the Savior. Okay, what's that? Uh, um, because of her uh, being a human being. Okay, yes. She said because of her humility. She needs a Savior because she's only immaculately conceived because of the Savior. If there is no savior, she will not be immaculate. Are you following Are you following the logic? Yeah, yes. That's why if there is no savior, she will not be immaculate. That's why she needed a savior. Mary will not be immaculate conceived if there is no, there will be no savior. But because there is a need for a savior, but I don't need. <laughs> From our perspective, of course, from the perspective of God, in a sense, there's no need for a Savior. It's really God's great love for us that He decided to send the Savior. Because God could just decide to, well, uh, you disobey me, it's your problem, go to hell. <laughs> right? But you see the abundance of the love of God. Huh? That's why we always say, like uh, during Christmas, this is always one of my points in my home. Like, the birth of Jesus Christ is nothing else but the story of a God who has been running after his son who has been running away from him. From the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven out of the garden. Remember when they were driven out of the garden? God himself said, but don't worry, I'll set you a savior. <laughs> Just like mothers, right? When you tell your daughter or your son because you're so mad because of what they... Get out of the house! After the house, after the child goes out, the little perch. It's like God, after driving away Adam and Eve in the garden because they disobeyed God, God himself said, I will send you a seed. It's like, I can look for you. Unfortunately, God has been sent in people, prophets, patriarchs, all of those to bring us back to the Father. He never came back until now. You might be saying, well, they, they came back, Father, so they go to church. When we say that came back, that means they've been committing sin. Committing sin is going away from God. That's why every time we commit a sin, imagine yourself stepping back to God. You're stepping back. Then every time you do something good, you step forward to God. The question is how many good and what do we do every day? Maybe 100 step, stepping back and only 10 stepping forward. <laughs> That's why God has to run after us. Remember the story about the prodigal son? Remember away when the son came back. Still, the son was still away, but the father can already see him. What does that mean? That from the moment that the son, which is the message of the prodigal son, which is the salvation story, that from the moment that the son left the house, the father is still with him. son has still with him. That's why he saw the sun from afar. Because if he's not waiting, will he see the sun from afar? He'll be busy working. <laughs> the sun is already there. Not I'm here. But no, the father saw him from afar. It means we just have to work. 
I think we will finish at least one slide tonight. <laughs> That's why even though Macbeth conception is not strictly speaking, explicitly expressing the scriptures, we have supports from the scripture. And that is living tradition. Okay? That's why if you are asked, for example, of teachings regarding the Catholic Church that are not found in the Bible, don't be, don't matter. Just begin asking the person, do you believe in the living tradition that are, there are many things that are not written in the Bible? Because if the person says no, then we don't have to argue. Because we will not believe. Come up with a solution. Okay? Just like when talking about the Blessed Virgin Mary, when somebody asks you about the Blessed Virgin Mary, any doctrine or teaching about the Blessed Virgin Mary, the first question that you should ask the person is, do you believe in Mary as the mother of God? If the person doesn't believe in Mary as the mother of God, forget it. Leave the argument. <laughs> There's no sense of talking. Because all of the things that we believe in the Blessed Virgin Mary is based, founded on our belief that Mary is the mother of God. If the person believes that Mary is the mother of God, then all the other doctrines are easy to explain. But if the person doesn't believe in Mary as the mother of God, forget it. You will not believe it. You'll just be fighting. <laughs> You'll just be fighting. That's why January 1 is the feast of Mary as the mother of God, the beginning of the year, the foundation of all her prior beliefs. Have you ever wondered why Mary, mother of God, on January 1st, as the year begins in the city of America? This is the foundation of all our beliefs in the present Virgin Mary. Let's at least finish one slide. <laughs> 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 so, so, because of that, okay. Therefore, we say that the Bible is the Word of God as it is put down in writing. When we say Word of God, it's also equivalent to revelation. Okay? So it is part of revelation that is put into writing. Okay? As I said, living tradition is bigger than the Bible. The Bible is just, allow me to say, it's just a portion of the living tradition. Under the breath of the Holy Spirit. When we say under the breath of the Holy Spirit, it means under the inspiration, guidance of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, by the way, when we say this, I, I don't know if you experience the same thing, but I remember when I was still a child, I really thought the Bible from the very beginning was already a book like what we have now. I even have imaginations of the book coming down from heaven. <laughs> remember that the, the, the Bible was written by human beings just like you and me. Everything in it. They are limited human beings just like you and me. But when they wrote those words, our belief is that they were under the breath of the Holy Spirit. That means under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's why everything that they wrote is according to what God wanted to convey. Okay? Inspiration. The author's intellects, that means Remember that in the Bible, there are, when you talk of the author of the Bible, there are two kinds of authors. Huh? <coughs> the most important author, God as the author. Secondary authors, the human authors. Those who actually wrote these words. Okay? Oh, by the way, don't think that when the Bible was written, they were like in trance and then everything is dictated to them and their minds would move as the spirit. No. They're using their own intellects. Okay? So that's why here it says, the author's intellects were enlightened directly by the action of the Holy Spirit to write what God wanted <coughs> and nothing more. God himself is the author. Guided, He guided the human authors. Let me read everything that I'll explain to you. Human authors are also true authors acted as free, subordinate, intelligent instruments. What do you mean by that, Father? That's very complicated and confusing. Okay, let me simply explain it this way. I'm trying to simplify things, okay? But when you study scriptures, it is not as simple as this. Let's just make it even very simple. Okay. This is how I normally explain it. If I am God, you are the human author, I will tell you 
tell everybody that everything that exists, I created. Okay, are you following me? So let's begin with that. If I am God and she is the human author, okay, she will be the one to actually write the book. I will tell her, please tell everyone that everything that exists, I created. Okay? And everything I created is good. She has a big problem now. She'll be thinking like, wow, how am I gonna, how am I gonna say that to people? She cannot just stand here and say, hey, God said everything that exists is his creation and everything that he created is good. You'll be asking it, well, what do you mean? What's your proof? What will she do? She'll come up of ways to relay the message. That's why we have the first creation story. The seven days, that's you and internet. That's not God. The point of creation story is not really to tell us how many days did God create. Come to think of it, is there days in God? Everything is ever present. But when do we have the seven days? Is the human author? She decided to say, Ah, oh, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make a story. Okay? And I will make it seven days because I have to slowly show them on the first day this is God creating, on the second day this is God creating. Even in the creation story, it says the evening came and morning followed the first day. So does it mean the whole day God was creating the light? <laughs> Think about that. On the second day, the dome was created. So the whole day, God was constructing the dome. <laughs> All right. I mean, even even the patient story says, when God said, let them be back. <laughs> Why do you have to wait for him in the morning? Today. Right? But all of those is the human author's intellect working. And then when he or she makes the story, she's able to do deliver the message, everything is created by God, and everything that He created. Okay? How does the human author do that? Well, the human author said, oh, in the beginning, there was darkness. Yes, there, there's darkness. Do you see anything? It's total darkness. Hopefully, there will be no power out things. <laughs> okay. But if it's total darkness, do you see anything? Nothing. That's the human author's intellect working. By saying in the beginning there's darkness. Okay. Because if there's darkness, then you don't see anything. The earth was formless without shape. That's what the book of Genesis says. Can you think of something without form or without shape? We even have our own shapes, right? <laughs> right? Can you think of a human being without shape? That's why when the human author say that the earth was formless and without shape, philosophically it means there's nothing. Because there's nothing that can exist without shape. Then you might be thinking, but Father, there are things that I'm thinking. Can you think of something without a shape? Even that thing you're thinking has a shape. Have you ever thought of that? Well, my, my, my major is philosophy. So. You cannot think, nothing, nothing. You cannot, you cannot think of something without a shape. Even the thoughts that we have has a shape. You cannot imagine something that is nothing. That's why in philosophy, you can't imagine nothing. By the mere part of imagining nothing, it's something. <laughs> Father, this is not philosophy class. But anyway, so, <laughs> the human authors, they are using their intellect. But at the end of the story, was it successful? Yes, because she was able to deliver the message of God saying, everything is created by God. How does she do that? By saying in the beginning there was nothing. Then God says, let, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. So everything that is there is let them be by God. So God created it. And then she says, and she found it very good. Okay. And then it's seven days. All of those details. So we have nothing to talk about for the first chapter of Genesis. 
<laughs> so I think this is clear. So human authors are also true authors because they use their own intellect coming up with all of these stories in order to deliver the message. In short, in short, by the way, the message is God's. The details are the human author. The message of every story is the message of God. But the details of the story are of the human author. Okay? That's why when you are looking for the message of God in the Bible, don't look at the details. Use those details to try to the message. Now, because, of course, if it is God who is the true author of the Bible, of course, it cannot be with error, right? It should be without error. God cannot bear. It's a biography. So, again, but when we talk of the Bible without the error, that's very much intertwined with the concept of inspiration, message. Therefore, when we talk of the Bible as without error, we're talking about was the, the, the story able to deliver the message that God wanted? That's the point. Okay, I hope you're following me. So the question is, if the Bible is without error, the point there is, is the story able to deliver the message that God wanted to convey? Not really the details of the story. Okay? Because if it will be the details of the story, then there are thousands and millions of errors in the Bible. Let me get to see what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Every story has a message. The message is the message of God. What's the message of the first creation story? Everything that exists is created by God. And everything that's created is the details of seven days, what was the first one to be created, those are not the points of the story. If we argue about those numbers of days, it will be non-stop. If we look at those details. Because just after the first creation story, when we get into the book of Genesis, second to that is the second creation story. Right? We have two creation stories. The most popular is the seven days. But are you aware that there's another second creation story immediately after the first creation story? And the second creation story tells us the earth and the heavens is there, although there is no grass, and then man will be created. Imagine, the first thing to be created of the second creation story is man. On the first creation story, what was the first thing created? We will not stop arguing with one another. So which is really telling the truth, Father? Is it man first or the light? So if we are arguing between those points, then we are parting up the wrong tree. The second creation story has totally different messages. And the most important message of the second creation story is to tell us that man, we, is the center of creation. That's why. He will now put man in the center. They will supply everything. They will supply everything. Since God said, look at the man is lonely. Oh, he created the animals. Huh? He's still lonely. He created the, the woman. In fact, before that, he created the garden. See? It's like the camera is focused on man. And then God will supply everything that he will need. Because the point of the second creation story is to tell us that we, human beings, is the center and the problem of creation. You're special. And amongst all of the other creatures, remember that it is only us who receive and away, rejected in the second grade story, our life from God. Remember Adam? How was he created? From the clay. After the clay, we have the body, and then the Bible tells us, and he breathed into his nostrils and he died. That means our life came from God. Did he do that to the animals, to the carabaos? He did not. you see all of those details. So, we look at the message of the story, not the details of the story. And when we look at the message of the stories, then there is no error in the Bible. 
Because our belief is that every story was able to deliver the message that God intended to deliver. Make sense so far? Or it's becoming more difficult? <laughs> okay, so the Bible, we have the Bible. Now it's one book, but as I said, remember that we did not begin with as but one book. There are separate stories so that put together. Okay? There are two parts of the Bible. We have two Testaments, right? The first one is Old Testament. The second is, of course, obviously, New Testament. Okay. Except for my other students who attend two, three Bible classes in the other parishes. <laughs> Those who just come here and say, Anthony, what do you mean when you say Old Testament book? What's your elementary understanding of it when you say elementary uh, Old Testament? <laughs> These are the books written before the time of Christ. Very simple. It's very elementary. Okay? When you say it's Old Testament book, that means this is a book that is written before the coming of Christ. Okay? Now, obviously, of course, when you say New Testament, these are the books written after the coming of Christ. Okay? But the more descriptive way of showing it is that the Old Testament books announce him, we don't know yet, yet who is the him, <laughs> in the Old Testament, it announces that there will be a savior, okay? Accomplish the work of redemption. In simple words, that there will be a savior. So in the Old Testament, they just know there will be a savior. So all the Old Testament books are saying there will be a savior, there will be a savior, there will be a savior. It practically announces, but it doesn't know yet who will be the Savior? Because it's still Old Testament. These are books written before. The New Testament books are the books that announce Him. Him here is Jesus Christ, or Jesus, announces Jesus as the Savior. He's already the fulfillment of the promise in the Old Testament. That's why the Jews don't have New Testament, right? It just makes sense. They don't have a New Testament. Why New, Why? Why do they not have New Testament? Because they did not accept Jesus to be the Savior, to be the fulfillment. Allow me to just say, until now, I would say that they're still in the Old Testament. <laughs> because they're still waiting for their Savior. Okay, so then from their perspective, they're still in the Old Testament because they did not accept Jesus to be the fulfillment of that. In the Old Testament. Therefore, if, if the Savior has not arrived yet for them, then they're still in the Old Testament, right? In a sense. But who is Jesus for them? Just a prophet. Nothing. They don't uh, so, uh, That's why remember that in the in the Gospels themselves, when Jesus told us the disciples, remember he said, after the feeding of the 5,000 men that counting women and children. Remember when they entered Caesarea Philippi, that's a pagan territory. Jesus tried to avoid the crowd, entered the, the Caesarea Philippi, and that all of a sudden everybody disappears because Caesarea Philippi is a pagan territory. Jesus had been followed by the crowds and everything like that. He cannot even rest. So Jesus is very wise. Enter Caesarea Philippi. They all disappear because they cannot follow Jesus there. They will be in trouble with the pagans. Right? When he gets there, it's only him and the disciples. Remember, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? And what was their answer? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. And take note of the next phrase. Or one of the prophets. What does it mean in our common language? It's like, ah, I don't really know as long as he's one of the prophets. <laughs> So for them, he's just a prophet. He's not yet the Savior. Then he says, about you? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter said, you are the Christ. That separates us from us. Anybody who believed in Jesus to already be the fulfillment of the promise in the Old Testament that there will be a Savior, will now have the New Testament. They are called Christians. That's why they are called Christians, because they believe in Jesus as by the way, I just would like to take this opportunity since we mentioned the word Christians, huh? Because remember, I remember when I was still very young in the seminary, the word Christian is very a very clear 
uh, work simply means anybody who believes in Jesus Christ. But nowadays, not anymore. He doesn't do for meeting now. Right? When you, when you say Christian, then you must be careful whether you are using it in a general sense to mean anybody who believes in Jesus to be the Savior is a Christian. Are we Christians? Yes. But remember that there is now a religion called Christian. So be careful of how you use the word. Okay? If you are using the word Christian to refer to anybody who believes in Jesus as a Christ or referring to the word Christian only to those people who call themselves Christians. Come to think of it, we are all Christians. I mean, all of those who believe in Jesus. Okay? Okay, let's go. So, let's go to the books of the Bible. How many books of the Bible? Again, the whole Bible is composed of 73 books. How many Old Testament? 46. 46. Very good. How many New Testament? 47. Prepare for the test next week. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the books and how they are called. Okay, now for the Old Testament, the Catholic day, we have 46 books. The Protestants, they have 39 books. Okay? That's why notice that the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible, they have a difference of seven books in the Old Testament in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have 27, they also have 27. That's why we don't have any disagreement in the New Testament. We have the same New Testament with the Protestants. Okay, the total is, we have 73 in the Catholic Bible, we have 66 in the Protestant. Okay, so there's a difference of... How do we call them? Okay, how do we call these books? Remember, I was telling you, here, 39. Oh, by the way, so just to be clear, okay? I hope you are able to follow. 39, those 39 are also there in the Catholic Bible, huh? Are you following me? Don't think that that's a different Bible, that only different books. It's the same. It's just that we have seven more. Okay. So the 39 books, those that are found both in the Catholic and the Protestant Bible, how do Catholics call them, we call them as the proto-canonical books. Those Catholic books. The Protestants, they call them as the canonical books. So the seven that we have, we call, we Catholics, we call them as the deuterocanonical, but the Protestants call them as the apocryphal books. Now, you might be thinking, why is mother have to see how to explain all these things? Because you might be reading since I'm assuming you are here, that means you're interested in knowing the Bible, so I presume that you'll be not just relying on Father from time to time if you have free time, hopefully you have, okay? You'll be reading some literatures regarding the, the Bible. This is one of the things that confused me in my personal study of the Bible, because writers will be using these terminologies and I go crazy like, but why is this writer saying, not this year? If you are reading a Catholic writer, he will be saying that you are canonical, and the, if it is a Protestant writer, he will be saying apocryphal, but actually they are talking of the same books. So careful of what you read, <laughs> if, whether it is a Protestant author or a Catholic author, because they use different terminologies. Because when we say canonical, that means measuring stick literally, it actually means all of those official list of the inspired books. Of the inspired books. That means books that we consider to be officially part of the Bible. Proto-canonical means first. Proto, first. Deutero means second. The truth is, my dear friends, to confuse you more, <laughs> to confuse you more, the truth is both are canonical books for us. We are just saying Proto and Deutero just to distinguish those books that are accepted by the Protestants and not accepted by the Protestants. But all of them are canonical for us. That's why both have canonical. Canonical. Okay? This 39 is just Proto 
first in a sense that okay let's talk about this 39 we don't disagree about this so it's so, okay when we're talking about deuterocanonical books uh, these are the books that our friends do not object okay so at least we are able to distinguish okay okay now there are also other books remember that we have 73 books in the bible right now but remember that there are other books that existed. It's beyond 73. Okay? It's beyond 73. In the year 44, the very first council, we call it Council of Rome, like a meeting of the whole church, that's the very first time that the church decided to say, let us look at the books and let us once and for all decide which are to be accepted canonical, which are not. Okay? And there are other books that were not accepted even by the Catholic Church to be canonical. So that is the Deuterocanonical, our Deuterocanonical for the Protestants is already apocryphal. That means not inspired. Deuterocanonical that is that. So when the protest, if it is a Protestant author and the Protestant author says, oh, the apocryphal books are like this, be careful being a Catholic because those seven books are part of their apocryphal books. But for us, they are still canonical. But the author, canonical. Am I confusing you more or making you fall asleep more? <laughs> so for these others, we have apocryphal books. We call it apocryphal for them to look the beyond these. Okay. I'll give you an example of a book that existed that we don't also accept. Like, for example, The Gospel of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's a book that the church did not accept to be inspired. If you go to that uh, Gospel of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that's where you will see the names of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Or the parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary. What's the name that we ascribe to them? Anne and Joachim. They're not found in the Bible, huh? The name Anne and Joachim, you cannot find it in the Bible. You find that in the Gospel of the Divinity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We just use that name. Living church. But the book itself was not accepted by the church. Also, the Immaculate, the Immaculate Conception is found in the Gospel of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin But the total book was not accepted to be inspired by the Gospel. So, you will see that the living tradition and the church sometimes will also live from the, from the considered to be popular books. Okay? If it is not a matter of dogma, what do you mean by dogma? Does it matter what's the name of the blood of the parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Yes. No, um, really, it's not necessary. We can change the names. We really, can in the beginning today, let's just call the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary to be Bernadette. <laughs> let's call the father to be Gabriel. That's under my name. <laughs> we, we make those things in order to make the stories easier to understand. Like for example, we have the names of the three kings. Right? What are the names? They're not in the Bible. The names are not in the Bible. We just ascribe the names. Why? It's difficult to just say, oh, the first king. You might as well say, Michael King. <laughs> you know, so easier to understand and remember the story. The Bible even doesn't tell us how many kings. We just said three. Because there were three games. So we're just saying, ah, oh, there are three games, so maybe there must be three games. But actually, the Bible doesn't tell us how here. It's come to think of it, when we come to a birthday party, right? One gift, the whole family comes. <laughs> but, but the point of the story is, again, message of the story, not the details. Okay. Uh, the point of the three kings is very simple but profound. And what is that? That these men came from where? 
from the east. From the east. <laughs> from the east. So when you say from the east, that means outside of Jerusalem. So that means if they are outside of Jerusalem, which means they gods. They are non-Jews. They don't believe in the promised Messiah. They don't believe in the promised Messiah. It's like this. People of Jerusalem, day and night, the Old Testament will tell us, they cry out to God, please send us the Savior, please send us the Savior, send us the Savior. And their belief is there will be a great sign in the heavens when the Savior will be born. And then outside of Jerusalem, the pagans, ah, they're crazy, they're believing in a Savior, there's no Savior, there's no Savior. And then one night, all of a sudden, there's a bright star. And the people outside of Jerusalem said, wait a minute, after all, I think what they believe is true. Let's check. <laughs> they look, let's check. And they found the baby. They who don't believe that there will be a Savior are the ones who found Jesus and recognized Jesus to be the Messiah. And the people of Jerusalem who have been praying for it are the ones who did not recognized him. So what's the point of the story? Um, just give it Father so we're done early. <laughs> the point of the story is our Savior does not depend on a scripture. It depends on recognizing Jesus to be the Messiah. Look at these people, they're pagans. But they recognize Jesus to be the Messiah. Okay. So does it matter how many of them so is it wrong to say three? No, because that's not the point of the story. Again, going back. Not the details, it's the story. Okay? It's the message of the story. As long as you deliver the message of the story. The details are of the human author. But the message is not. Is the story written by the human author able to deliver the message of God? Yes that if every story is able to deliver the message that God wanted to be delivered, then there is no error in the Bible. But if you're talking about details, then there's a lot of errors in the Bible. In fact, it's the most crazy book in the world. <laughs> it has all the contradictions. Okay? That's why, as I said, if you are looking at the details, you will not be able to finish even chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. You will be fighting. Because there are two creation stories. Chapter 1, first creation story. Chapter 2, second creation story. And they are totally different stories. I did that. You will be fighting each other. So which one is true? Right? You will not be able to move. Because you are looking at the details of that. Okay. So, what this Old Testament books, okay, and be classified into four groups. We have what we call as the law, also called as the Torah, also called as the Pentateuch, also called as the books of Moses. These four refer to the same books, have different names we ascribe. We have also books we call as wisdom, we also have books called historical, we also have books called prophecy. How many Torah? Actually, Torah also means the law. Pentateuch, right? We have Pentagon. What does that mean? Penta? Five. Five. Okay? These are the first five books. Okay? Then we have wisdom, which are seven books. We have historical books, which are 14. We have prophecy, which is 20. Okay? Which is 20. So total, remember, we're talking of the Old Testament here. 46. What are the law or the Torah, the Pentateuch, this is the Pentateuch. Maybe uh, just uh, take a picture perhaps. <laughs> okay, the students are so fast, take a picture. Okay, so the wisdom books, these are the seven wisdom books. These are the history books, 14. These are the prophecy books. And this is the New Testament books come up with something in order to easily memorize the books. Okay? The students are very fond of that. We have, for example, the New Testament, the most popular. Anywhere I go, that's what everybody knows, how to memorize the 
I thought it, at first when our teacher taught us that in high school, I thought it's only him composing it, only to realize that no, it's something that is worldwide to be used. But the more good than John of Sector the Roman ones, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John, Jude, and Revelation. <laughs> See the songs, it is here. Believe me, when I was teaching high school, they come up with all the songs rhymes for all of this classification. So let's see who will be the better composer in this group. <laughs> There's a test, huh? <laughs> Let me end with this. I'm sure you'll be asking me, so what are those seven books, Father, that are in the Catholic Bible, but that is the Protestant Bible? These are the seven books. Tobit, Judith, first Maccabees, second Maccabees, Baruch, Islam, Ecclesiasticals, or sometimes also called Syrah. And aside from those seven, we have these two books, Daniel and Esther. Only portions of them are not found. Chapter 3, verse 24 to verse 19, and also chapter 13, and also chapter 14. Portions of Esther, uh, chapter 10, verse 14, to chapter 16, verse 14. They don't have those portions. They have the two books, but these portions are not found. Why are they not in the Bible? Till we meet again on the first day. Okay, we'll end here. Any questions so far? So I know that our schedule of the Bible class is 6.30, but obviously we always have to wait for the Mass to finish, so we don't really are able, we are not able to really begin like 6.30. But I think I just wish you that it will always be like this, 6.45 to 7.45, or we can go up to 8 o'clock like a bit of time. Yeah. in days that we need to. So as I said, so we have printed the book of Genesis. Actually, you can have your own Bible. If you buy your own Bible, buy the New American Bible because that's the version that I use in my reading. But mind you, even though it's a New American Bible, the New American Bible itself, they have different versions. That's why if you read it, will be. So uh, personally, if you ask me, you'd rather buy this because when we read, we have the same wording. So we'll be reading the same thing. And then at, on the second, the right column, you can write your own notes as we discuss. We'll be reading the Bible, and uh, obviously we are only able to cover some portions in one hour. Father talks a lot, so in one class, hopefully we are able to finish one chapter. And there are 50 chapters of the Book of Genesis. That means the Book of Genesis itself will be 50 classes. Okay, I'm just saying that because a lot of people are telling me, how many sessions are this Father? 8, 10, 12, oh, this is non-stop. <laughs> this is non-stop, so hopefully you don't disappear along the way. But it, we try our best to make the stories interesting. Amen? Okay. Amen. There's no question, let us all stand. And let us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Loving Father, once again, we express our gratitude to you for giving us the inspiration, the wisdom, and also for guiding us to come to our Bible class because we all strive to be closer to you and to know you. And we are trying our best to know you by reading the Word of God, your Word, because we believe that you reveal yourself to us through these words. We ask this through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, with and, you. and may the Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.